I think it's very hard to compare Chinese and Western music. Okay, it, uh, confession. I went to the first time to China when I was 13 years old and I saw something of the Peking Opera, the, the traditional Chinese opera, and I was totally perplexed. I didn't go to China for 15 years until with the CUIMF. And I went back uh, with them and one of their, they were incredible hosts and they, they showed us the most amazing parts of, of the cities. And one, on one of the evenings we went back to the Peking Opera. So it was my second experience and I was equally perplexed as when I was 13. But what really struck me and what I wouldn't have noticed when I was a, when I was a child was the audience, the Chinese audience next to me, were moved to tears by what was happening on the stage. I was, after an hour or so, getting almost stir-crazy from, from, the, from the experience, and I saw this old man weeping with genuine emotion. So I thought, that's, that's the, the, the key to this, is that when Chinese uh, listeners come and experience Beethoven and Schumann for the first time and look perplexed by it, Well, I think nowadays performers, I would say expected, but also enjoy doing a little bit of everything. So we play concertos, we play, like today, chamber music or, or recitals, and many of us are teaching, including the soloists who have been established for 30, 40 years. They've all started to teach, which is a wonderful thing. The one thing that is universal in teaching across all cultures or across all schools of teaching. You can't create talent. This is paraphrasing a, a wonderful um, Russian pianist pedagogue, Heinrich Neuhaus. Uh, but you can create the environment where talent can flourish. So that's the idea. And that's what I have to do in my class at the academy. And it's what is going on, for example, in China, in America, in every continent where the good teaching ha is happening, it's where what is beautiful in a, a student's personality, musical personality, is allowed to blossom. Finding the right instrument and the right bow, I have to say, and the combination of the two is, I would say, like chasing a rainbow. This violin came to me out of the blue. I was playing on a lovely Guadagnini that was on loan to me from the academy when I was a student. And I was playing Prokofiev's second concerto here in London and somebody in the audience came to me after the concert and started asking about the violin and said, what happens when you will graduate and you have to give it back? And I said, well, I don't know, because that was the truth. And he said, well, I have one at home, not doing very much. I think he even said sitting under the piano, maybe you'd like to try it. And it came to me graduating and I still didn't have a plan and then I remembered this conversation and so I called him, I went over and I picked it up and okay, this is a fantastic violin, it's Gennaro Galliano from 1750 and that was 2015 and he's very, very generously just allowed me to, you know, keep playing it since then. So um, it was one of those out of the blue uh, lucky uh, lucky moments. So today we're playing the first sonata for violin and piano by Robert Schumann and the second sonata by Sergei Prokofiev. There's almost 100 years separates these two pieces. The Schumann um, from 1850 is totally dependent as was the Prokofiev and this is the link between the two on the collaborators uh, which these com composers enjoyed. A lot of great pieces would never have been written without the artists and I have to say also the wives of some of these composers pushing them. This was definitely the case with Schumann because his wife was Clara Schumann, a wonderful pianist, and she had a duo with Ferdinand David who was the, one of the great violinists of that generation behind, for example, the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. He was an integral part of that process. Ferdinand David and Clara Schumann uh, were playing a lot the uh, Kreutzer Sonata, the Ninth Sonata of Beethoven, which is nearly 40 minutes long. And Clara one day said to, to her husband, you know, this Kreutzer, it's wonderful, but it's so long and it's so tiring. Is there no chance you could write us something that, you know, 
has this dramatic first movement and this very uh, elegant second movement and a virtuosic finale which the audience loves, but sort of half the size of the Kreutzer. And he did, that's exactly what he did. This sonata is just about 20 minutes, so it's about half, but it has those three characters in, in the, in, across the movements. And of course it, it has even more um, romantic spirit. Mit Leidenschaftlich im Ausdruck, he, he describes the first movement, so with passionate uh, yearning and emotion. The beauty of it, why it's such a gift, I think, to the repertoire, is that it has this broad emotional spectrum, but it is condensed, so the, the movement structures are, are very tight and short, so it's, it fits perfectly into a program. And then the Prokofiev, he was dependent on David Oistrach, uh, who was the top Soviet violinist for this sonata to be created, because he had written it in 1942 for flute. And then Oistrach loved it so much, he said, we have, to, we have to make a violin version from this. So a lot of the effects and the double stops and harmonics, they come from Oistrach. Of course, the musical content is pure Prokofiev. So this is the first time I'm playing with Dinara. As you know, it's been a little bit of a long process for this recital actually to happen because of all the continual renewing of lockdowns. I have to say things are looking much more optimistic now. Looking forward to the summer, the autumn, there are a lot of concerts that had been postponed that look like they will indeed happen and even cautiously optimistic uh, because some new bookings are coming in for season 21, 22, so it looks like things are going without a doubt in the right direction.
Thank you. 